All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew Schneck. I'm the Digital Media Manager for Amerisur Financial, and I'd like to welcome you to the second part of our Amerisur Presents Banking Basics series. Uh, if you didn't have the chance to join us last week for part one, don't worry, you won't be missing anything today. Uh, but you can view last week's session on our YouTube channel if you're interested. Uh, you can also uh, find it by going to amerisurf.com slash presents on our website. Uh, we're once again welcoming our Senior Vice President of Retail Banking, Carrie Mueller, as our featured presenter today. Uh, today's focus will be on creating and following a financial budget, which I think is something that we can all definitely use. Uh, just quickly, I'd like to mention that all attendees have been muted upon entering the session in order to avoid any kind of audio interference. Uh, we are recording this session, uh, so please be aware of that. And if you have any questions, we certainly invite you to share those with us in the chat. If you're looking for the chat window, it should be found in the lower right hand side of your screen. I'll be monitoring that feed throughout Carrie's presentation and we'll have a Q&A session at the end and we promise to get to your questions at that time. So uh, I think that's enough prattling for me. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Carrie. Thank you, Drew. And thank you for joining us once again for week two. Um, the topic this week is going to be on budgeting. Um, which, as Drew said, is a, is a topic that many of us really would like to learn more about, but maybe just don't have the time. So I'm looking forward to sharing some pointers for you and some easy steps into which you can manage your money. For the most part, budgeting has gotten a bad reputation as something that is restrictive, boring, and does not work. However, all that a budget is, is a plan for your money based on your priorities and goals. Have you ever wondered why some people are so good with their money and others are not? Likely, someone taught them how to manage their money so they can create the life they want. But most of us, like me, weren't born knowing how to intuitively manage our money. Our parents likely didn't discuss, let alone teach us. Uh, when we were in school, it wasn't part of the curriculum. And so we, we learned it by really the school of hard knocks. However, here is the good news. Budgeting is a skill set that anyone can learn. In fact, according to a survey from personal finance management company Mint, 65% of Americans have no idea how much money they spent last month. Other research has shown that money is the primary source of stress for many Americans more so than personal relationships or even work. The biggest thing you can learn right now is to budget effectively, which is why we thought this webinar would be so beneficial to many consumers out there if you're struggling from paycheck to paycheck. Anyone can write down a monthly budget. However, living on it are two totally different things. When you budget effectively, you track your spending and you stop spending when you run out of money. A budget that actually works has all of your expenses built into it so that you will not be surprised when your car registration and taxes are due or when you have to pay your insurance premium. It also helps you deal with fluctuating bills such as higher heating bills during the winter or air conditioning bills in the summer. This is the biggest step you can take to stop living from paycheck to paycheck. It can also help you stop from having periods when you go crazy with spending and end up blowing all of your money for the rest of the month. So let's go ahead and look at some of the steps we will be going through today on how to establish a budget. The first one is simply how to make a budget and then learning why should I have a budget? How do I decide what to spend my money on? What's breaking my budget? How does my budget compare? We'll look at some key points and then at some next steps that will be important for you to carry it out. So let us move forward with defining some of the key terms we will be using throughout this presentation. A good starting point for creating a budget is to designate needs versus wants. Needs obviously get priority and every budget should cover those first. Needs are things required for daily life, food, clothing, housing, and unavoidable costs associated with everyday living. Wants are things you could do without if you had to, something that makes life more comfortable or enjoyable, 
designer clothing, or a sports car could be designated as a one. Distinguishing between needs and wants will help you live within your means. Part of creating a budget is also distinguishing between your fixed and variable expenses. Variable expenses are the type that will change from month to month, such as groceries, gas, entertainment, or eating out. Your fixed expenses are those mandatory expenses that you pay the same amount for each time. Items included here are things like your mortgage or rent payments, car payments, regular child care, and others. And then finally, it's important to understand the difference between all types of income. Knowing the difference will help you when planning your expenses. Simply put, the money that comes from your household is called income. There are many sources of income that can fund your budget. Gross income is your total income before taxes and deductions are taken out. Your net income is the money remaining after taxes and all other deductions are taken out. This is used for your budget. And finally, discretionary income is the money you have left after all your bills and obligations have been paid. It is used then to achieve your financial goals. So to create a budget that works and allows you to live a comfortable life and a happy life, you need to get a firm handle on what you're currently spending, what you can afford to spend, and what your priorities are. So before we begin, the first step in establishing a budget is number one, to gather up all your financial statements and paperwork. These may include things such as bank statements, recent utility bills, W-2s and pay stubs, credit card bills, receipts from maybe the last three months, and any mortgage or auto loan statements. You will want to have access to any information about your income and expenses at this time. One of the keys to the budget making process is to create a monthly average. The more information you can dig up, the better it will be. The second part then is to calculate your income. So how much income can you expect each month? If your income is in the form of a regular paycheck where taxes are automatically deducted, then using the net income or your take home pay amount is fine. If you are self-employed or have outside sources of income, such as child support or social security, you will want to include these as well. Record this total income as your monthly amount. If you have variable income, for example, from a seasonable or freelance job, it's best to consider using the income from your lowest earning month in the past year as your baseline income when you set up your budget. And then it's time to move on to create your list of expenses. And these expenses could include things like your mortgage payment or rent, car payment, insurances, utilities, child care, any transportation costs. Use your bank statements, receipts, and credit card statements from the last three months to identify all of your spending. So now that you have your expenses all written down and we've determined the income, we need to determine then which are the fixed and which are the variable expenses under that column. Your fixed expenses are those mandatory expenses you pay the same amount for each time, very similar to fixed income. They include items like mortgage or rent payments, your car payments, regular child care. If you pay a standard credit card payment, include that amount and any other essential spending that tends to stay the same amount every single month. If you plan to save a fixed amount or even pay off a certain amount of debt each month, also include savings and debt repayment as fixed expenses. So as we defined earlier, variable expenses then are the type that are gonna change from month to month. So if you do not have an emergency fund, you may want to include a category for surprise expenses that may pop up over the month and possibly derail your budget but we will start assigning a spending value to each category, beginning with your fixed expenses. 
Then we will estimate how much you will need to spend per month on your variable expenses. If you are not sure how much you spend in each category, review your last two or three months of credit card or bank transactions to make a rough estimate. If your income at the end, once we total the columns, if your income is higher than your expenses, you are off to a good start. This extra money means you can put funds towards areas of your budget, such as retirement savings or paying off debt. Also, if you have income more than expenses, you could consider adopting the 50-30-20 budgeting philosophy. In a 50-30-20 budget, needs or essential expenses should represent half of your budget, or 50%. Once should make up another 30%, and savings and debt repayment should make up the final 20% of your budget. If your expenses, on the other hand, are more than your income, that means that you are overspending and need to make some changes. So if you are in a situation where expenses are higher than income, find areas in your variable expense columns that you can possibly cut. Look for places you can reduce your spending, like possibly eating out less or eliminate a category like canceling your gym membership. If your expenses are far above your income, you have significant debt, reducing your variable expenses may not be enough. You may need to trim your fixed expenses and increase your income as well to balance your budget. Aim to have your income and expense columns to be equal. This equal balance means all your income is accounted for and budgeted toward a specific expense or a savings goal. And finally, review and tweak. Because circumstances change. Our priorities shift. We change jobs. We move. We have children. Make an appointment with yourself every few months to sit down with your budget and make sure it's still working with your current goals and realities. If you have already got your numbers plugged into a program or website, it is easy to play around with your budget categories to see where you can create some extra room or prioritize one thing over another. Remember, your budget needs to work for you, not the other way around. But some of the biggest reasons people do not create a budget include some don't think they need one. Some say they never stick to one. Some feel they, just, they don't feel like making one or they feel restricted. Some even don't, they don't know how. There's no one type fits all budget. If you have ever tried to create a budget and failed, maybe it was not the right one for you. Whatever your reason for not budgeting, here are a few reasons why you should consider a budget right now. Number one, it stops you from overspending. Spending money without carefully thinking about where it all goes can easily lead you to overspend each and every month. Overspending limits your spending power in the future as more and more of your income has to be applied to debt payments. If you are worried about restricting your spending, Consider what it would feel like to have most of your paycheck being applied to credit card payments. The stress of finding a way to pay for your everyday needs can be astronomical and where most of your paycheck is already spoken for. Use your budget to help you determine when to stop spending. An envelope system or a budgeting app can make this process easier. So let's take a quick look at each one of them. The envelope system is one of the easiest ways to track your spending. By switching to envelope budgeting system, once you have a budget in place, it may seem a little trendy, but it actually has been in existence for over 100 years. Most likely, your grandparents used this system or one similar to it. Here's how it works. You divide up all your discretionary spending, which is all the money you have left over after everything has been paid, into envelopes by category. So 
So one, it might be for eating out, one might be for groceries, one might be for clothing, and other miscellaneous spending. Generally, you do not pay your bills using this system. You'll continue to pay them out of your checking account through direct debit or by writing a check. However, to make the, the envelope system work for you, you should stop using your checking account except to pay bills and use the envelope system to pay for everything else. Before you start the envelope budgeting system, though, decide which categories you are going to switch to with your discretionary income. As I just mentioned, some common categories that are used are the groceries, eating out, gas money, entertainment. The next step then would be to add up all the discretionary income and the spends that you have decided where to put in your envelope and make a withdrawal with your bank for the total. Generally, it is best to write a check and request the required denominations you need for each category. For example, if you are allocating $25 a month for household items, you will need a 20 and a $5 bill in that envelope. Remember, no borrowing from other envelopes. Then you will label those envelopes with the categories and the monthly allotted spend. Then put the correct amount into each envelope. You'll find a safe place in your home to store your envelopes and remember not to carry them with you at all times. While it's a never a good idea to carry a large amount of cash, you may want to get into the habit of carrying $20 or so in cash with you at all times to cover unexpected expenses or any potential spends at possibly a cash-only business. But when you do go shopping or you go to have fun, take money from the appropriate envelope. You do not want to take the whole amount with you because you will be more likely to spend it all. This is especially true for your food and entertainment categories. So take what you would like to spend on that particular outing, and then when it's gone, it's gone. Afterward, put the receipts in the envelope so that you can track your spending at the end of the month. This may help you notice spending issues and identify problem areas such as shopping and eating out. The most important takeaway with the envelope budgeting system is that when you run out of money for one particular envelope, you have to stop spending in that category. This is why the budgeting system is so impactful. It helps you stick to your budget without running out of money each month. Another plus, if you consistently run out of money in one envelope each month, that may show you that you have a budgeting or spending issue in that particular category. If you do have money left over in any of the categories, you can choose to roll it over into the next month. This may work for some categories like groceries so that you can stock up where there is a good sale or when you are saving up for something possibly more expensive. You may also splurge with extra money, use it, maybe pad your emergency fund or put it towards one of your long-term financial goals. The other option is a little bit more simpler, and it's only a budgeting app. If you need help reining in your spending and getting your personal finances under control, using a budgeting app rather than the envelope system might be the way to go. There are many budgeting apps to choose from, fighting to distinguish themselves from each other. The number of money management, personal finance, and budgeting apps is so large so it, help, it helps to know which ones are designed with the most users in mind while offering exclusive tools for those with unique needs. You can find many of them just by searching on the internet or checking out our AmeriServe webpage to find one that works best for you. A second reason why you should have a budget is that it does help you save money. People who do not have a budget tend to save less money than people who do. And that's because when you budget, you assign money to do certain things. You can have money automatically transferred into a savings or investment account each month, and a budget can help you stop dipping into your savings each month. As you do these things, you begin to build wealth and give yourself true financial freedom. 
Another important reason to establish a budget, it allows you to be flexible. And budgeting can be flexible. You can move money between categories as you need to throughout each month, but generally you should restrict yourself from touching the money you set aside for savings. But you can always adjust it as you go. It is just another way that you can keep yourself from overspending. It also allows you to recognize issues and adjust so that if you don't have enough at the end of the month, you know how to adjust accordingly. And finally, a budget puts you in control. Budgeting can help you gain a feeling of control over your money. It allows you to prioritize your spending, track how you are doing, and realize when you need to stop. It puts a solid plan into place that is easy to follow and gives you the chance to plan and prepare for the future. It is the biggest tool you have to change your financial future, and it gives you the power to start making those changes today. So checking on your budget each day can help you maintain control. Making those decisions at the beginning of the month makes it easier to manage your money. So now that we have learned why you should have a budget in place, how do you decide what to spend your money on? This is where your decisions on needs and wants come into play. Once you know what it is you need versus want by tracking your finances, you can think about the long-term benefits and drawbacks of purchases. Far too many purchases are impulse purchases. While this is fine when it may be a $1 chocolate bar at the supermarket, it becomes a problem for larger purchases. Before you buy something, think about how it will affect your future. How long is it going to last? Is it going to put you in debt? Is the value you will get from it over the lifetime worth the cost? These are questions you can use to determine if something is really worth buying. Two, only put money on your credit card if you can afford to pay it off each month. Credit cards are not inherently a hindrance on your finances. After all, they are convenient and many cards offer cash back on purchases. However, you should only spend money on your credit card if you are able to fully pay it off at the end of the month. If you pay off your credit card balance each month, you will not incur any interest charges and it will essentially be the same as paying cash. If you do not pay off your balance each month, though the interest accrues, it can quickly spiral out of control. Number three, stop trying to impress other people. The average person spends far too much money merrily trying to maintain an image. From fancy cars to brand name clothing, much of what we buy has to do with impressing others than it does to do with purchasing something that we actually want and enjoy. However, keeping up with the Joneses is an expensive and unnecessary pursuit. Buy the things that you enjoy and do not fall prey to the feeling that you have to spend in order to impress other people. After you start tracking your finances, you can begin looking for habits that may be draining your budget. These habits could include expensive hobbies, maybe eating out too much, spending too much money on clothing, or any number of other financial drains. Once you figure out which habits eating up large portions of your income, you can then evaluate whether or not these habits are really necessary. And the fifth lesson regarding how to know what to spend your money on is about learning to value saving over products. Some people are naturally good at saving money and draw enjoyment from growing their wealth. For others, money is something that is spent the moment it reaches their hands, and anything else feels like a wasted opportunity. If you find yourself in the second camp, try to adopt a mentality that values savings over product. In the end, money invested or money saved will almost always benefit your life more than money spent on products that will wear out or become uninteresting in little time at all. And finally, start investing early. 
Spending your money wisely isn't just about avoiding unnecessary purchases. It also requires you to take the money that you save and put it towards things that will help you reach your financial goals. With that in mind, there is no such thing as starting to invest too early or investing too little. No matter how young or old that you are or how little money you have to invest, putting your money into quality companies that will grow in value as time goes on is always a wise use of your income. So now that we've learned how to create a budget, why it's good to have one, and deciding on what to spend your money on, you can discover what is breaking your budget. And some of the reasons may include that it just isn't realistic. If you have ever abandoned a new diet just days after starting because the only thing you could eat were carrot sticks, you understand the uselessness of an overly restrictive and unrealistic plan. Similarly, many budgets have no wiggle room, making them impossible to follow for any length of time. If you're starting with zero savings and no budget at all, it's not realistic to expect yourself to completely overhaul your spending and eliminate all impulse purchases or unexpected expenses in a month's time. One of the main pitfalls for people who abandon budgets is going from no budget at all to trying to cut spending dramatically and setting impossible goals. If you set yourself up for failure, that is precisely what you are going to get. A solution is finding a budgeting method that works best for you and your family. At the very least, you should track your spending each month through the envelope system or through an app. And if you find that you are already spending most of what you earn on living expenses and other needs, saving 50% of your income is not attainable. Instead, pick targets within your reach. You can always change your budget in the future as your spending habits and saving needs also change. Another reason why your budget not, might not be realistic is that you do not know why it does not work. If you do not understand the reason your budget keeps failing, you are never going to find one that works for you. Knowing what about your current system or those that you have abandoned in the past can help you figure out how you can succeed in the future. A solution is pay attention to the feelings you have when you think about your budget. Are you ignoring it because you hate spreadsheets? Well, ditch the spreadsheets in favor of something like a service that automates budgeting for you. If technology is not your thing, again, maybe try the envelope budgeting system. If you think budgeting is boring and you lose interest quickly, Maybe brainstorm ways to make it more fun. For example, turn it into a game. Think of staying on track like the thrill of maintaining a winning streak in your favorite sport. If you are not sure which method is best, try a few things before settling on one or deciding budgeting does not work for you. The third thing why your budget might not work for you is that you just don't know your spending style or your triggers just yet. If you do not know what you splurge on the most or what types of situations make you throw caution to the wind, you cannot choose a budget that fits your style. For example, if you almost always stick to your grocery list, but you can't stroll past a clothing store without ducking in just to look and then strutting out $50 poorer, your grocery budget probably isn't your most significant problem area. So one of the solutions are knowing both your triggers and strengths, and that can help you find a no-fill strategy that will work for you. Pay attention to your spending style. Do you find it easy to say no to buying stuff for yourself but you love to maybe spoil your kids? Or perhaps you are an emotion shopper who turns to retail therapy after a hard day. I'm much more likely to shell out cash on impulse purchases when I'm clothes shopping without a clear plan of what I need to buy. I am very vulnerable when it comes to the lure of good deals and limited time only sales. So I never walk into a clothing store without a specific list of the things I am going to buy there. 
If it is not on the list, even if it's a good deal, I do not allow myself to buy it. If you know your spending style, you can identify your challenge areas and use some strategies to help keep your budget under control. Stay on top of your spending and address those trouble spots earlier. Or what possibly happens when your partner, your family, your friends are not on board when you establish a budget? Maybe that's why your budget isn't working. If you're trying to make and stick to a budget, but the other people in your household are not willing or even aware of your efforts, they could unintentionally sabotage you. Think about your past attempts at budgeting. Does your partner stop at trying to save money? Are your roommates encouraging you to splurge when you want to be saving? The people we spend time with influence our spending habits for better or worse. If those closest to you are not on board with your budget strategy, you will probably have a harder time staying with it for the long haul. So the solution here depends on who is being the bad influence. Before imposing yet another budgeting strategy on your partner or family, talk with them about your short and your long-term goals. Would you like to buy a house soon, maybe travel more, or have the time to learn a new language? Your goals do not have to be budget goals, simply things in your life you would change given the opportunity. Once you have identified them, think about how having more control over your budget, and thus more money at your disposal, can help you accomplish those goals. For example, if you'd like more free time to pursue some hobbies, sticking to a budget and saving money means you don't have to work as much and you can make more time to pursue other interests. If you're thinking maybe of starting a family, but can't fathom affording the baby-related expenses, getting your budget under control helps you financially prepare. If you can figure out a way to convey to your loved ones that sticking to a budget offers more options rather than less, you can finally get everyone on the same page. If your roommates or friends are a bad influence on your spending, it's possible they just don't know that you're trying to budget or cut back. But once you have an open dialogue, you might find that they are understanding or even in a similar situation. But the most common reason your budget might not be working is it just doesn't fit your lifestyle. If you have budgeted 30% of your take-home pay on housing, but live in an area where a high cost of living is, adjust the categories and make your budget work for you, not the other way around. You also have to choose a budget with categories that fit your lifestyle. For example, if you download a budget spreadsheet from the internet that's filled with columns like property taxes or your car payment, and you don't own a house or you don't own a car, you could give in to temptation to spend that money instead of saving in those categories because the budget doesn't feel like yours. So a solution? Tailor your budget to your current spending categories and then look for places to edit and reduce your spending. For instance, if you're putting more than the recommended 20% of your budget towards paying down your student loans because you have a goal, possibly be debt free in five years, that's okay as long as you save money in other areas and stick to your budget. Again, find a budget that fits your lifestyle and spending categories first and then work on trimming your expenses. And lastly, a budget will, do not, will not work if you do not have goals. It is much easier to drag yourself to the gym if you have a specific target, like possibly losing 20 pounds in six months or keeping the money you bet on a fitness goal. Similarly, it is much easier to work towards a financial goal rather than just merely saving money because you know you should. If you find it hard to stay motivated to save money or to follow a budget because you do not see the point, you first need to figure out what your goals are. So before you try yet another budget, ask yourself some questions. What would you do with an extra $250 or $500 a month? Would you be able to buy a house sooner or maybe contribute to your retirement plan? When you're thinking about your goals, make sure they're smart. Goals are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Whatever the goal is, knowing you are working towards something makes it much easier to stick to a budget. 
and always remember to reward small successes. Just like a lack of goals can hurt your motivation, failing to build in any rewards also makes it harder to stick to your budget. It sounds counterintuitive since the whole point of a budget is to reduce spending, but by rewarding yourself from minor victories or achieving small goals on the way to a larger one, you encourage more of that behavior that brought on that release in the first place. So go ahead. And it's essential that your reward feels indulgent and makes you happy. It can be as simple as splurging on something small. But there are tons of free and inexpensive rewards to help you avoid that frugal fatigue, which can lead to failing and falling off the wagon and falling off your budget and blowing all your cash that you've saved after making yourself miserable. So make a list, and when you achieve a small goal, pick something off the list as a reward for your success to help you maintain your motivation. So how does your budget compare to others? Well, keeping up with the Joneses usually leads down a bad financial path, so why look at personal finance statistics like the one shown on the screen? Well, these type of statistics give you a baseline to compare to as you assess your own financial health. You can assess it if a financial challenge is unique or maybe it's just a widespread size. It's maybe just a widespread statistic given a weak economy. Are you falling behind because of debt or are you ahead of the curve with a well-balanced household budget? By using and looking at these financial statistics, you can keep in mind and always know where you stand. Each year, the Borough of Labor Statistics releases an overview of average household money management stats. The most recent report covers spending habits. So on your screen is how some of the budget categories you see break down. 33% of housing costs go to rent and mortgage payments. The average household spends 56% of their food budget on groceries and 44% on dining out. 40% of transportation costs go to the vehicle, such as maybe paying off the auto loan. 21% goes to gas and oil, while the remaining 32% spend on other costs, such as repairs. And for health care costs, 69% covers insurance. The other category that affects spending habits is obviously winter holiday spending or Christmas. Americans spend more money this time of year than any other. So as you can see, many compare yourself, compare themselves to this budget and that they can see that Americans save and Americans also spend money. And you can consider yourself part of that group that digs themselves deeper into debt or you can look at yourself as a saver. In fact, the Gallup poll only found that about 32% maintain a household budget and only 30% of Americans have long-term financial plans that include savings and investment goals. So where do you consider yourself? After learning all of that, there's one important lesson. So some of the key takeaways is having a budget is knowing where your money is going instead of wondering where it went. This sense of control can reduce your stress and help you reach both short and long-term financial goals. Eliminate those budget busters. The small things add up, whether it's excess ATM fees, eating out every day, or other financial goals or savings, you need to make sure that you understand your needs and wants. Your home, your safety, and food are the things that you need. And know your income and expenses. Beware of the lifestyle creep. As you earn more income, do not spend it all. With every increase in income, budget half of that money to your savings and add the other half then to your discretionary income. Make sure you are living within your means. Total income minus total expenses should be a positive number. If not, you need to adjust how much you spend on your wants and track your expenses. Calculate your spending categories. Use the 50, 30, 20 rule. Remember, the recommendation is that 50% of your income should be for needs, 
30% for once and 20% for savings or debt. Use these tools and methods and understand where your money is going by creating a written or online budget. So the next step in figuring out a budgeting method is really the first step in maintaining and tracking your budget. This practice will eventually form a habit for you. If you can continue to use the following strategies, it could ultimately help you move forward in creating your budget and hopefully reduce stress. Finally, be patient with the process. Even if your income and expenses change each month, plan where you want to spend your money. Also know where every dollar goes and then adjust when necessary. With a little attention to detail, patience and willpower, you can be on your way to financial freedom that you've always been striving for. So good luck. Thank you for your time today and I look forward to our next webinar, which will focus on credit and debt. Thank you, Drew. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Carrie. Definitely appreciate that. I mean, we had uh, just uh, just two quick questions here for you. Um, one of the questions was was around um, how detailed you should get uh, when it comes to you know your budget and your 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 discretionary or your want spending. And I I think you sort of started to touch on that right at the end there about you know eating out every day and things like that. How small expenses can can really start to add up when when you might not expect them to. And you're exactly right. And I think by really, I think actually a budget should be as detailed as possible at the beginning, just so that you know exactly where all these small things are adding up. You know, you think people, you go to Starbucks every morning or you, you know, you, um, you go out to eat every night and, you know, you may think that it doesn't add up. You're putting $5, $6 here and there every day. But if you look at it on a monthly basis, you will see that it adds up to maybe over $100 each month. And those are the kinds of things that you don't really realize, but when you have it written down in front of you, those are the ways that you can really start to eliminate, you know, those costs that are affecting your budget and where you might be able to save. Definitely. And the, the other question uh, sort of was about um, what you said about, um, about uh, limited time offers, things like that. Um, I, I know that, you know, personally, I see a lot of like countdown timers and things like that on, on online deals, uh, stuff like that. I, oh, how, how do you um, uh, recommend that you sort of avoid those sort of limited time offers or those sort of pressure sales uh, impulse buys? That's a very good question. I mean, stay away. I, I don't, I'm not real <laughs> sure. Um, it, it's called willpower. I mean, it really and truly is. I mean, you're going to run into those every day. I'm not real sure if there's a way that you can stay away from them. Because as I said, um, if I walk into a clothing store or I walk into anywhere, and if I don't have a particular list of the things that I need um, and I'm there for, I will tend to just start putting things in the cart and, and, and you know, things that maybe I don't need only because I see that it's a good deal or like you said, it's a limited time offer. So really um, it, it is called willpower. And, and I'm not saying that every single time it might not be, um, you know, a bad choice because if it is a limited time offer and you see we go back to looking at how is this purchase going to affect, you know, my budget, but is it really going to, um, benefit me in the long run. And I think that that's what you need to look at. So, you know, again, it's, it's one of those things where you have to, you either do the envelope and you have your envelope and you have the exact money that you need to spend and, and you know what you need to do, or, um, you know, you go ahead and make the purchase knowing that it is a good purchase in your mind and that it is going to pay off in the long run. I think that something you said about Christmas time probably falls into that category too. You get a lot of Black Absolutely. Friday deals, things like that. But a lot of times, what I've noticed too is that those limited time offers aren't really limited at all. If you if you if you see some of those timers online and then you you come back a week later, it, funnily enough, it's still that same price. They're just trying to push you into something. So you're exactly um, right. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, uh, Carrie, thank you so much once again for, for your time today. I, I think all of that was incredibly informative, and I think a lot of people can definitely benefit from that. I, I know that I wrote a few things down for myself personally as well. 
Uh, next week, as Carrie said, we are going to be doing uh, the third installment in uh, Carrie's um, uh, series for the month of August, which is going to be on credit and debt. Uh, and I think that some of that is going to tie in nicely to what we talked about today with budgeting uh, as well. And uh, so uh, definitely join us for that. The recording for this session will be available uh, both uh, through our website and on our YouTube channel. Uh, we usually have them up within about 24 to 48 hours. So uh, if you uh, missed part of the uh, session today or want to catch up or just revisit something, uh, by all means, uh, check us out online as well. Uh, all right. Well, Carrie, thank you once again. I appreciate all of your thank time. Thank you. Absolutely. Great. Have a thank nice you day. So much. You too. Bye-bye.